Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. This is lecture number nine. We are going to talk about reverse transcription and integration. And, you know, I don't know if you notice, I have a quote in, in the front of every lecture that kind of gives you the flavor. And this one is from Alice in Wonderland, and it really beautifully sums up today. One can't believe impossible things, said Alice. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. So this story begins in 1908 with the discovery of chicken leukemia virus. That is a virus, as the name implies, causes leukemia of chicken. However, back then, we didn't think that was cancer because people only thought solid tumors were cancers. So it was ignored, but then later rediscovered. And we will actually talk about this virus today. Um, uh, actually, not. we're going to talk about it when we talk about cancers caused by viruses. Uh, three years later, Peyton Rouse, he was working at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, which is the name at the time. He discovered a, a virus that causes solid tumors of chickens. And it was named after him, Rouse sarcoma virus. He got the Nobel Prize 55 years later. It's the longest incubation period for a Nobel Prize. And fortunately, he was still alive. Otherwise, he wouldn't have received it. But he died a few years later. And these, were, these viruses were called tumor viruses initially because they caused tumors. But then years later when we discovered that some viruses could have RNA in them. These viruses were found to have RNA genomes, both chicken leukemia and Rouse sarcoma virus. So here is Ellerman and Bang and Peyton Rouse. So people wanted to know how these viruses caused tumors. And what we did know is that they had an RNA genome. And when they infected a cell, they caused permanent changes, which are called transformation. And that will be a subject of a separate lecture later on, transformation and oncogenesis. So somehow um, these RNA viruses were permanently changing the cell. And Howard Temin came up with the idea that somehow these RNA viruses were converted to DNA, which integrated into the host genome and became a permanent part of the host DNA. And so there's Howard Temin. He worked at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, what is that? Go Badgers? Is that, is that Badgers? I think so. Uh, pro, that he came up with the provirus hypothesis. You will find out today what a provirus is. It's the integrated DNA copy of the retrovirus, a very specific name for that. So Howard Temin. And we will come back to him when we talk about transformation. So at the same time, David Baltimore was working on this problem, and he came at it from a different angle. He, he developed a Baltimore scheme, right? And he said, plus strand RNA viruses, they are mRNA. There's no need to have RNA polymerase in the particle. And then uh, he, he thought about negative strand RNA viruses, and he said they must have a polymerase in the particle. And he and his wife, Alice Wong, discovered it in VSV in the particle. And then when Temin started coming up with this idea that these RNA tumor viruses uh, had to make DNA, Baltimore said, the enzyme to do that, copy RNA and DNA, must be in the particle. Because he said, I don't know of any cell enzyme that can do this. And as you'll see, that wasn't correct, but we didn't know it at the time. And so he postulated that there must be an enzyme. So both Temin and Baltimore worked on this from different angles. And they both published papers in Nature, the same issue, where they discovered the enzyme, and they both uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1975. And um, so here is, is Temin's RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in virions of Rouse sarcoma virus. And this, there's the DNA uh, provirus hypothesis that these viruses uh, replicate through a DNA intermediate. And the same with Baltimore, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase in virions of RNA tumor viruses. They worked on two different RNA tumor viruses, but they found the same enzyme in the particle. Uh, and uh, this is the topic of today. Uh, if I, I was a, a postdoc with David Baltimore in, in 19, 1979 to 82. 
just before I came to Columbia. And uh, I've, I've interviewed him a couple of times. Uh, and TWIV 100, he, he talks about uh, his discovery of that enzyme. So the enzyme is called reverse transcriptase. And they called it that because... Uh, the ability of the enzyme to reverse the flow of genetic information, the famous dogma of molecular biology, DNA goes to RNA to protein. This enzyme goes RNA to DNA, but not the protein from DNA, of course. Then the DNA goes back to RNA and protein, as you will see. So reverse transcriptase. This enzyme has revolutionized science, in my opinion, molecular biology, it has enabled us to make DNA copies of genes. It has, and you can use that for making therapeutic proteins, for making vaccines, for making vectors. Almost everything we do, every SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid diagnosis, or most, yeah, every one depends on reverse transcriptase to copy the RNA into DNA before you do the PCR or whatever other amplification, lamp amplification, or whatever it is. They all depend on RT, and you can buy this from many different companies. Um, so it's amazing. Uh, all of the, many of the vaccines, I should say, depend on making DNA copies of genes that you can use in the vaccine. So it's, it's just amazing what this has done. And neither scientist patented the enzyme. So the uh, viruses with reverse transcriptase that we'll talk about today are shown on the Baltimore scheme. And they include the retroviruses. So the RNA tumor viruses I just told you about, they're retroviruses that they were later renamed from RNA tumor viruses to retroviruses. Retro reverse transcriptase. They have a plus stranded RNA in their particle, which is copied by an enzyme in the particle to double stranded DNA. And then we're going to talk about hepatitis B virus, which is a DNA virus. But it has reverse transcriptase in its reproduction cycle. It actually encodes it in the genome. It is present in the particle. We'll see how that works out. So those are the, uh, well, those are the two kinds of viruses that have reverse transcriptase in their reproduction cycle. But only the retroviruses uh, integrate into the host DNA genome, which is one of the questions from the exam, if you remember. All right, so Rouse sarcoma virus from uh, uh, Peyton Rouse is a retrovirus, and here is a, a, an electron micrograph of it. They're envelope viruses with a dense core, a nucleocapsid in the middle. Here's a schematic. Uh, there's the membrane. There's glycoproteins uh, embedded in the envelope, of course, always when the virus has a membrane, always has glycoproteins in it. And this is called the surface glycoprotein. It's a spike, basically. Uh, then inside there is a nucleocapsid. It's a protein shell with a protein shown in red. And inside that is the RNA genome. It's a plus-stranded RNA genome. And there are two copies of it. So you could say these viruses are diploid. And that plus-stranded RNA is coded in nucleocapsid protein, NC. Also present in the particle are other proteins, including reverse transcriptase. It has to be in the particle because... As soon as this gets in the cell, it's going to be copied to DNA. There's also another protein called integrase, which we'll talk about. And there is a protease that's important for maturation, which we'll talk about next time. So that is um, the way the virus particle looks. And here's the genome. Now, our retroviruses, we, we divide just for sorting things out into retroviruses with simple genomes, uh, like Rouse sarcoma virus. This is avian leukosis virus. That's the chicken leukemia virus. It's a different name for it. Here's the viral RNA, uh, which is packaged in the particle. It's a typical mRNA. It's got a cap. It has a poly A tail. And it codes for three uh, general regions, the gag, the pol, and the envelope. They're called the envelope is the spike, of course. Polymerase is the reverse transcriptase, and the gag encodes the structural proteins uh, that make, like the nucleocapsid and the uh, the um, protease and the capsid protein itself, etc. This uh, RNA is translated to form a gag pol precursor, uh, and then that is processed by proteases to give you the gag proteins and polymerase separately. 
And then to get the envelope protein made, you have to have a splice. The RNA has to be spliced and remove out the gag pole region. And now you have a envelope mRNA. And that gives rise to the SU, the spike protein. This uh, RNA is made in the cell from an integrated DNA copy of the viral RNA. It's called the proviral DNA. So when I say proviral DNA, it means integrated. It has very specific features that we'll talk about today. You can see it's got two sequences at either end called LTR. That's long terminal repeat. We'll talk all about them. And then the genes for gag, pole, and envelope are uh, shown there. Viruses with complex, retroviruses with complex genomes include HIV. And that gets its own lecture later on in this course. The reproduction cycle is shown here. The viruses bind to receptors, many different kinds of receptors for retroviruses. Um, some of these fuse at the cell surface, at the plasma membrane, and the nucleocapsid comes into the cytoplasm. The RNA stays in the capsid. It doesn't leave, which is one of the reasons why it's not translated. The ribosomes can't get to it. The um, RNA is then made into DNA right in the cytoplasm within the capsid. And then that goes, the DNA goes into the nucleus. It integrates, becomes a provirus, and there it's transcribed to form messenger RNAs which give rise to all the proteins that are needed to make new particles. We will talk about the assembly of these viruses later on, but the key here is that this is an integration event. Someone is asking, retrovirus has an icosahedral capsid and a helical nucleocapsid. So this, this shell is um, icosahedral, but the, the, the RNA protein is not helical. It's not arranged with that kind of helical symmetry that's characteristic of other uh, negative strand RNA viruses. And it's very much like the coronaviruses. They have a plus strand RNA genome uh, bound up uh, by a nuclear protein. But so we don't call that helical nucleocapsid. I would say the, it's an icosahedral nucleocapsid in this case. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, there's no icosahedral capsid. So we do call it a helical nucleocapsid in that case. So reverse transcriptase, here's some features of it. It is a primer-dependent enzyme, requires a primer. That primer can be DNA or RNA, and we'll see how that works in a bit. The template also can be DNA or RNA, RNA or DNA. So first in the, in the infected cell, it's RNA. And then as you'll see uh, later on, you have to make a double-stranded DNA from the single strand that you make, and that's done by RT. However, it only incorporates deoxy-NTPs, not ribo-NTPs does not make RNA. It only makes DNA from either a DNA or RNA template. So again, the, the basics are the same as we've talked about for other polymerases. There's a template that's read in a three to five prime direction and primer de dependent synthesis uh, template directed in a five to three prime direction. A little bit more on reverse transcriptase. Turns out that it's in cells. Baltimore and Temin didn't know that. Bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes all have their own reverse transcriptase activity. So here's the tree of life. We have bacteria, we have archaea, and eukaryotes. They all have RT. So the common ancestor, the last uh, common ancestor, probably had RT as well. It probably evolved before the separation of archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes, and that common ancestor of all of them. And as I've said or mentioned briefly, we think our reverse transcriptase is the bridge between the RNA world and the DNA world. RNA polymerases probably evolved early in the RNA world, and then uh, they, they changed to become reverse transcriptases, and up, out came the DNA world from that. So cells have them, uh, but they're very low levels in our cells, not enough to reproduce retroviral genomes. That's why the retroviruses have to bring in their own reverse transcriptase. So retroviruses have reverse transcriptase of their own, which is distinct from the cellular reverse transcriptase. Hepatitis B viruses have reverse transcriptase. And the colimole viruses, these are uh, interesting DNA viruses of cauliflower. <laughs> they also have reverse transcriptase. So when you eat cauliflower, you're probably eating them, although I assume you've cooked it. Maybe not. No, you cannot cook cauliflower. But it doesn't matter. They're not going to reproduce in you. Here's the phylogenetic tree of these uh, reverse transcriptases. And so these are in blue are the virus or virus-like reverse transcriptases. So there are 
in the hepatitis B retro cholimoviruses, and there are uh, some mobile elements uh, like gypsy and copia that have reverse transcriptase. They're not viruses, but they're virus-like. Then we have bacteria and archaeal reverse transcriptases. Of course, telomeres that keep the ends of our chromosomes intact, they have their own reverse transcriptase. And then our genome has reverse transcriptase in it, and those are called lines, and we'll talk about those a bit today. These uh, reverse transcriptases are one of the four nucleic acid polymerases that we've mentioned before. Here is the HIV-1 reverse transcriptase structure, and it is, of course, a RNA-dependent DNA polymerase with a lot of the conserved regions present in other nucleic acid polymerases. And in particular, it has an ASP, ASP in the active site. The ASP, ASP coordinates two metals, which in turn coordinate uh, the, the triphosphate to get polymerization going. These are all right hands. And so the RT looks like a right hand with the active site in the palm domain. The reverse transcriptase copies RNA into DNA. It copies RNA as a template and makes a DNA copy. It has a second enzymatic activity in it, part of the same protein. It's called RNase H. And it's important for the reproduction cycle of retroviruses. RNase H cleaves RNA only when it's double-stranded. And the, that's what I mean by a duplex. And that double-stranded duplex can be RNA, RNA, or RNA, DNA, but not DNA, DNA. It will not touch DNA because it cuts RNA. So here is a, a diagram of that. The RNA is green, the DNA is blue. So this is an RNA, DNA hybrid. The RNA H is an endonuclease, which means it cuts internally. It doesn't chew from the ends. That would be an exonuclease and makes these cleavages uh, and it makes short oligonucleotides with five prime phosphates and three prime hydroxyls. You know, between each base is a phosphate. And so it cleaves between the O and the P. And it is basically chewing up the RNA because it's going to be thrown away for the most part. And you will see how that plays into the reproduction cycle in a moment. So that's what RNA-SH does. And it's in, in, in the particle, it's part of reverse transcriptase. Here's a model of the HIV-1 reverse transcriptase. This is one is actually made of two protein subunits, the P66 and the P51, which are pulled out separately. So you can see them here and you can see the colors, how they line up here. But the uh, overall enzyme nevertheless looks like a right hand with a palm domain with the active site and a thumb and fingers as well. So there is the uh, catalytic site for the reverse transcriptase. And then the RNase H is a separate catalytic site. But you can see here is a RNA DNA hybrid uh, moving through the active site. So the RNA comes in one end and then the DNA is made. So now it's a duplex. And then as it passes by the RNase H, the RNase H chops up the RNA part to get rid of it because you don't need it anymore. We'll see how that works right here. So here's a cartoon of the enzyme. Again, um, the, the catalytic site for the reverse transcriptase is here. And you can see the two metals coordinated by the aspartates. So the RNA comes in here. That's the palm domain. The RNA comes in on the left side. It, is, uh, it serves as a template for the production of a single DNA strand. And now out comes an RNA-DNA hybrid. And then downstream, in the enzyme is the other catalytic site, the RNase H active site, where the RNA is degraded. So out comes just single-stranded DNA. And that actually, the RNase H also needs two metals to uh, degrade the RNA. This is a pretty slow process. The 9KB genome, which is what the retroviruses are, takes four hours <laughs> to do that. That's a long time. And it's very error-prone. Makes one mistake per 10,000 to a million bases. So it's very much like other, uh, like RNA dependent RNA polymerases. So these are, so the question is, uh, these RNA viruses are, have RNAs. How does it not chew its own genome? The answer is that the RNAs H only chews an RNA DNA hybrid. It will not chew single stranded RNA. And that's why it doesn't chew its own genome. And the other question, what metal? Could be magnesium 
or manganese. Either one works. Reverse transcriptase has revolutionized molecular biology. Which statement about the enzyme is not correct? Reverse transcriptase is unique to retroviruses. It's packaged in the particle. The protein also has RNA-SH activity. The name comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information, might have bridged the ancient RNA and DNA worlds. All right, let's see what we have here. All of you have 86% got A, which is correct. The Incorrect, sorry. RT is not unique to retroviruses. Everything else is uh, correct. Question, since cellular RT is insufficient for viral RNA, is that why mRNA vaccines don't carry a significant risk of integration? <laughs> yes. There's very little RT in cells. I mean, that, what would, it wouldn't even, so a paper, a preprint came out about this a while ago. And I think it's just, it's not very good because they had to overproduce reverse transcriptase in cells. Then they infected them with SARS-CoV-2 and they get DNA made and it integrates in pieces, not the whole genome. So yeah, would it even matter if we integrated, it, not in somatic cells, right? Because somatic cells turn over. If somehow it got into a, a germline cell, but I think that's just so unlikely and that's not what that virus does. And, and at any rate, as you'll see later, the, um, the, um, there, we have pieces of many other viral genomes in us that are just accidents. And yeah, it's only the spike in the vaccine. So it doesn't really matter, but it doesn't happen. I'm quite sure. Now let's take a look at reverse transcription. The particle has two copies of RNA, right? And they are, um, they are attached to each other at one end as shown in panel A here. And the way they are attached is by this kissing loop complex. So the the five prime end of the RNA is highly structured, as you can see down here, uh, stem loops. And um, these, these stem loops are complementary to a, a different part of the other, actually the same part of the other RNA, uh, because they're inverted complementary sequences as shown here. So the, here's one RNA in the second RNA in the bottom, one RNA in the left, one, second on the right. They base pair in this sequence, and that helps to bring them into the particle. And we'll see how that works next time. There is also um, There are also two copies of tRNAs in the particle attached or base paired to the RNA as shown here. The tRNA in the red part is the primer binding site, PBS. And um, so these tRNAs are cellular tRNAs, of course. They're brought in. You'll see their function in a moment. So two copies of RNA and two tRNAs. The RNA, of course, is coated with nucleocapsid, and there may be 50 to 100 molecules of reverse transcriptase in the particle. So why is there a dimer? What's the function of being a dimer? We think it, is, it explains why these viruses are relatively resistant to ultraviolet light and ionizing radiation, which cause mutations in the DNA. Uh, so the idea is they're more resistant than other viruses where there's only one copy of their RNA genome. Uh, the idea is that if you have mutations in one copy, maybe the other copy won't be mutated and recombination can help make a functional RNA genome. So what we think happens is that the uh, reverse transcriptase here in this example is beginning on the right end and making the blue DNA actually flicks back and forth between the two copies randomly. And so, you know, if there is a, uh, a mutation somewhere in the genome, let's say uh, this, this black A is mutated, you know, eventually you're going to get the right A on the other strand by chance. That's the idea. So recombination or copy choice, which means the enzyme goes back and forth to, to two templates could build one functional genome. So this is perhaps an explanation for the function of having two RNAs in the particle. So here is the uh, primer tRNA binding. We're going from the, the whole RNA at the top. We're looking now just at the five prime end below it. So there's the mRNA. It's got a five prime cap. Uh, and then the primer binding site where the tRNA hybridizes is very close to the five prime end. And uh, you can see how this tRNA kind of fits into the RNA. The RNA has a stem loop structure in the absence of the tRNA. And the tRNA base pairs and kind of disrupts the middle of that, that loop there. And uh, these, um, you know, different retroviruses have different tRNAs. This, this avian leukosis virus 
the tRNA is tryptophan, and other other retroviruses have different uh, tRNAs. And you can also see here that there are uh, sequences that are labeled R and U5. We're going to come across those again. They're important, as you will see. Uh, and these are inverted repeats, inverted repeat left and in, 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 the, in the central inverted repeat. So these are long terminal repeats uh, that are going to be built from this, as you will see. So let's talk about reverse transcription. The particle binds its receptor. It fuses at the plasma membrane. The nucleocapsid comes into the cytosol. It becomes permeabilized. So it's not intact, so that triphosphates can get in. And then the reverse transcription happens all in the cytoplasm. So let's go over that process, a really interesting process. So here we have the RNA as it uh, is in the particle, 5 prime N, the primer binding site with its tRNA, uh, and then the 3 prime N. And I've looped these around because that's how it works. Um, there are these R and U5 sequences in the PBS, and at the 3 prime end, there's RU3 and a different one called PPT. And we're going to see what they do. The Rs are identical, but the U5 and the U3 are not. First thing that happens is reverse transcriptase uses the tRNA as a primer and starts to make DNA, which you can see in this second panel. So now you have U5 and R DNA. They're the complement of little U5 and little R. Okay. Reverse transcriptase makes that RNASH chops up the RNA. So now we have a little, a small piece of DNA. It's, it's 100 bases. It's very, very short. And uh, this big R will now be able to hybridize with the little R because it's complementary. And this is going to, the enzyme, as you'll see in a moment, is going to continue copying around this circle right here. So here we have the base pairing of R and R or annealing. That's called the first template exchange. Why? Because it's gone from one end of the molecule to another. And then the reverse transcriptase will continue to copy the RNA, as you can see here, eventually go all the way around. And as it's moving, the RNA is degraded, right? You see the RNA is, is going away. However, there's one piece left called PPT, polypurine tract, and that's going to be a primer for the other strand. And in fact, even before the first DNA strand is done, this PPT starts to prime the complementary DNA strand. So the light blue is the complementary strand. And it's got the tRNA is still attached at this point. And then we've copied all the way around. We've now copied that first strand. Where does this occur in the cell? In the cytoplasm in a subviral particle. The partial capsid is still around it. And so now that you make a copy of the primer binding sequence where the tRNA is bound to, right? And then at the same time, uh, the DNA, the second strand is, is being initiated from the PPT RNA primer, and it is copying the primer binding site from the tRNA. So the T PBS is copied twice, once from the RNA genome right here and once from the tRNA primer. Eventually, RNA-SH removes uh, these primers, the PPT and the tRNA, so that we can start making the second strand. Now, you, have, you can notice here the light blue is flipped around. It's because the artist couldn't do it any other way. It's really hard. <laughs> you would have to twist it, okay? But it's the same idea. So now we have this short piece of uh, second strand, which will bridge the PBS. Remember, that's complementary. So that's going to base pair there. And now the RT will continue to go around. But uh, look at what we have here now. We've made something unique here. We have now R U5, R U3. And before we didn't have all three. We had uh, either U3 or 5 and R. R was present on both. Now we have all three, and that's going to be important in a moment. So now we're making the second strand here. Uh, it's going to go all the way around. Now we have a fully double-stranded molecule. Okay. And look, at each end, we have U5, R, U3, PPT. Then we have U3, R, U5, PBS, primer binding site. So stretched out, that's what it looks like. And now we have made an LTR at either end. We have U3RU5, U3RU5, 
lung terminal repeat, which wasn't in the RNA. And I'll show you that in a moment. And then we have the primer binding site just at one end and the PPT, the polypurine tract at the other end. So now we've taken one molecule of RNA and made two strands of DNA. So someone asked if the RNA is degraded, how does the virus make more genomes? Stay tuned. We're getting there. So we have gone from a RNA, the single RNA, we made a double-stranded DNA from it, and the RNA had only RU5 PBS at one end and RU3 PPT at the other end. The DNA now has a full LTR, U3RU5, U3RU5, and it's got the PPT and the PBS. I made an animation a couple of years ago about this. You can find that will help for you to see it. It goes around this whole process uh, in an animated form. So we have generated LTRs. The RNA doesn't have the LTR, and you'll find out why in a moment. Next question is, which of the following steps occur during reverse transcriptase of retroviral genomic RNA? Priming of minus DNA synthesis by tRNA. Two template exchanges. Degradation of the viral RNA by RNA-SH. Generation of two LTRs, all of the above. So if you're confused about minus DNA, the mRNA is plus stranded, right? So that first strand is minus DNA. All right, let's see what we have here. Look at that, 100%. Now, granted, it's only 34 of you, but that's our first 100%. It's all right. Okay, the first time I've taught you properly. <laughs> the next thing that has to happen, we have this... Now, double-stranded retroviral DNA with an LTR at either end has to integrate into the host cell, All right? So there's your viral DNA. There's your host target. And when it integrates, then this is what it looks like. We have integrated DNA. Now it's called a provirus. Now it is a provirus. We have LTRs at either end, and then we have host DNA. And... Two features of this integration tell you that it's retroviral as opposed to any DNA just sticking in the genome. First of all, the host sequence is duplicated at both ends, and you'll see why that happens. So the host target here is purple, but that purple sequence is now duplicated at either end. Here it's shown as red on the left and orange on the right. And then you lose two bases or so from the LTR. So you see you have AATG, now you just have TG. And you lose two at the right end also. And that's a feature of integration, which we will uh, look at in a moment. This proviral DNA is then transcribed by host POL2, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, to make mRNA, a capped polyadenylated mRNA. And as you'll see in more detail, I think, the, the promoter begins about midway through the LTR. So each LTR has a Paul II promoter and a terminator. So the mRNA terminates at the second LTR. So it's falling short of the both LTRs. That's why you have to regenerate the LTR during reverse transcription. That's why we have all that weirdness, the jumping and all that happening, because you have to regenerate the LTR on reverse transcription because it's lost during transcription in the nucleus. So let's take a look at integration. This, of course, is carried out by the enzyme called integrase. Um, it's a tetramer. So here it is in, in uh, beige. And there's retroviral DNA, which binds the integrase. And the integrase, uh, also its active site depends on metals like magnesium or manganese. Choose two bases off of the end of the retroviral DNA. That's where those two base losses come from. The integrase takes them off. It gives you uh, a five prime overhang and a three prime hydroxyl. And then the integrase nicks the target DNA and ligates the retroviral DNA, DNA to it, as you can see in this third step. So now both strands of uh, the retroviral DNA are linked via those three prime hydroxyls, the, the, the ones that are chewed back a little uh, to the host cell. And then the rest happens by the host. The, the host repairs this, this gap and ligates the ends together. 
And that gives you the duplication of, of the host sequence because uh, you, you're now, you've got the same sequence on the top and the bottom strand of the host DNA. And when it's filled in, you end up with a duplication in orange and in red. So that's the integration reaction. Integration occurs at many places in our chromosomal DNA, but it is not random. And these, this is the results of one experiment that addresses that here. We're looking at percent integration of three different retroviruses. This was studied by sequencing insertion, insertion sites. Um, and so there's a, avian leukemia, or leukosis virus, murine leukemia virus, and HIV. And this is the percent integration that they observed uh, within genes or at transcription start sites. And then this is the number you would expect by random integration uh, into the genome. So you, you'd expect 26% within genes and 5% within transcription start sites. You just see ASLV uh, within start sites is about the same as you'd predict, but it's a little bit higher for within genes, as is uh, MLV, but MLV is higher within transcription start sites than you would is expect from randomness. And uh, H HIV is about twofold higher for transcription site start sites and much higher within genes. So these integrations can happen everywhere, but they, they're not completely random. They have some, some biases, as you'll see in a moment. Does ligase cut cellular... The, the integrase is making the nick on the uh, viral, the cellular DNA and um, chewing back the viral DNA. So here's an overview. We've got the nucleocapsid coming in. It's, a, it's permeabilized, shown by the dotted lines. And then reverse transcription happens in the cytosol. And then the DNA goes into the nucleus and it then integrates. And the integration is mediated by integrase, of course, that, that's the tan protein shown there, but there are also other protein-protein interactions. So now, once that retroviral DNA gets in the nucleus, it's coated with nucleosomes. So our chromosomal DNA, of course, is already chromatinized. And as soon as the retroviral DNA comes in, it's coated uh, with nucleosomes as well. And um, interactions between uh, various proteins guide integration. And, and I'm showing that to you on the right here in, an, in a blown up version of what's going on in the nucleus. So this is for HIV-1. This has been studied uh, for, a, for a lot of retroviruses, as you might gather. First of all, there's a protein called BAF that uh, binds the viral DNA in the cytosol and goes in the nucleus with it. And BAF prevents the DNA from integrating into itself because you might ask, well, maybe the integrase would just integrate in, into itself, fold back. And yeah, that's possible, but it doesn't happen because of BAF. That's called barrier to auto something. I forgot what F stands for. All right, and then we have here integrase bound to HIV DNA, right? And you can see integrase is interacting with this protein called LEDGEF, which in turn interacts with nucleosomes. And so that's what is directing uh, the uh, integration. And then we also have this bridging interaction here. Look, there's Paul 2 making cellular mRNA, and that's binding a, a few other proteins, which in turn interact with integrase. So maybe for HIV, there's a lot of integration at uh, transcription sites, twice as much as you would expect randomness. And so maybe that's in part because um, of these bridging interactions. So the point is that uh, this DNA is brought in by specific protein-protein interactions. How does, how does BAF prevent auto-integration? It just coats... Um, the DNA and prevents integrase from binding. So here's a summary of what we've just talked about. We have one DNA made from two RNAs by reverse transcription. So the, from one particle, two RNAs, you end up with one double-stranded DNA, not two, just one. Uh, you, you build a strong promoter within the LTR. The promoter is in each LTR, actually, and so is a terminator. And the left end LTR serves to initiate transcription and the right end serves to uh, terminate it. But there is a strong promoter here in the right hand LTR. So if this um, integrates near a gene, it could turn the gene on. And we'll see examples of that later.
Someone asks, is BAF only present in retroviruses or in all, for all cells with RT? Uh, well, BAF is a cellular protein. And it would be preventing auto-integration of any uh, viral DNA that would try to integrate, which is retroviral. So the proviral DNA, which is integrated, the host transcriptional machinery recognizes this left-hand promoter and makes viral mRNA. And that's going to give rise to viral proteins, but it's also going to be packaged into new virus particles, right? The mRNA is translated or encapsulated. And when you think about this, there's as, as we have looked at this so far with RNA and DNA viruses, there's no DNA replication. There's no RNA replication, right? It's, it's amazing. There is no RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that makes genomes. There is no DNA polymerase that makes DNA genomes. What we have is the integration. This DNA, of course, is duplicated along with the chromosome uh, when the cell divides. Um, but there's no viral enzyme doing that. And, and the new genomes are made by Paul II. We have reverse transcriptase, which just makes the DNA copy, and then everything else is done by the cell. It's really remarkable integration. And the summary is here. We've talked about, again, the RNA in the nucleocapsid is copied to DNA right in the cytoplasm. The DNA integrates, and then the provirus is transcribed by the host cell to make proteins, to make mRNAs that are translated into proteins to build new particles into make genomes that are encapsulated. So some of those mRNAs you see are coming out and being encapsulated. And we will talk about that later. The provirus is a permanent part of the host genome. Now, if the cell dies, it doesn't matter, right? So HIV-1 infection kills cells. Not all of the cells it infects, though. It infects um, some uh, hematopoietic stem cells that live forever. And that's the problem because they have a provirus in them and we can't get rid of it. Once this DNA gets in, it doesn't go out again. It only, <laughs> the virus only gets out by transcription to make mRNAs that are put into particles. And in many organisms, the, the virus, the retroviruses that infect them, infect germ cells, sperm and ova, and they become a permanent part of those cells, as long as they don't kill them. And then they're passed on to their offspring. And so that's why our cell genomes are full of ancient and modern, what we call retro elements, derived from uh, infection of germ cells by, re by retroviruses, a process we call endogenization. So many in humans, for example, many years ago, hundreds of thousands or thousands, tens of thousands of years ago, someone was infected with a retrovirus that integrated into their germ line. They started to pass it on to their offspring. More and more people uh, acquire that endogenous retrovirus. Over years, it sustains mutations, so it can then differ from person to person. Sometimes it can be lost. Other times it's fixed, and we actually use some of the genes uh, that are present. But in humans, we have lots of these endogenous retroviruses, 8% of our genome, right? None of them make infectious virus. They're all mutated. And so they're, they're quite old. But in other species like mice, they have endogenous retroviruses that do make infectious particles that can infect other animals. Now, this process of endogenization, that is, a retrovirus infects the germline and is then passed on to offspring. We can see it happening now in real time in koalas, which of course are native to Australia. Uh, koalas you find anywhere else, are they originated in Australia. You can find them in zoos elsewhere, but they're not native anywhere else. And in Australia, apparently about 50,000 years ago, a retrovirus infected a koala, probably from rodents, and this has now been passed on all the offspring of the koalas. It's gone into their germline and it is endogenizing them, but they're not all endogenized yet. Here's a map of the um, eastern part of Australia. And these pie charts show uh, of the number of koalas that have been checked, how many of them have endogenous koala retrovirus sequences in their germline. And in all their cells, of course, because the germ, this, the germ cells contribute to all cells. So you can see in the north, they're all endogenized. But then as you move south, you have 
larger and larger fractions. And, and on some islands, no koalas are yet endogenized. However, uh, these viruses are spread among koalas by by sex, by contact. Um, so eventually they're all going to be endogenized. And that's a problem because this retrovirus, the koala retrovirus causes an immunosuppressive disease and these animals get other infections and it kills them. Kind of like HIV AIDS in people. And so, uh, you know, colonies have been established outside of Australia that are koala retrovirus free. Uh, and in Australia, they're trying to figure out what to do about this. Otherwise they will lose uh, all of these these cute animals. But, you know, for us, it's endogenization and process. We can't see it in humans because, you know, everybody, all humans are endogenized already. So it happened a long time ago. But we can see it happening now. We can study it spreading and so forth. Uh, the question is, are these viruses evolutionarily pressured to confer benefits? Most of them are not. Most of them sit in the genome. They're trashed. They're mutated. They don't do anything. So I think they are just there. They're harmless, and we can accumulate. We can accommodate them. We have a big genome. It doesn't matter. Eight percent of our DNA. What's the difference? But we have used some of the genes, as I'll show you in a moment. So there is some benefit. Now, together with this discussion, we have to talk about retro elements. This is different from a retrovirus. A retro element is a sequence that moves around in our genome or any uh, life form's genome by reverse transcription. So we have among those endogenous retroviruses, ERVs, which are integrated proviral DNA in our germline, right? And end up, it ends up in every cell. As I've told you, these are often replication defective in humans. They all are. But 42% of our genome is made up of mobile genetic elements, uh, all of which move, many of which move around by reverse transcription. So these endogenous retroviruses and all the other retro elements move around. And what do I mean by that? So here we have um, a copy of, say, here's our, our cellular DNA down here. This is some kind of retro transposon. That means a, a DNA element that can move around by reverse transcription. This could be an endogenous retrovirus or any other of the retro elements that I'll show you in a moment. So you make mRNA. That's the mRNA there in red. And then just by chance, accidentally, it can be copied to DNA because our cells have reverse transcriptase. And even more rarely, it will integrate. So basically, this gene has now jumped somewhere else. It's duplicated itself and integrated somewhere else. So that's how we have so many. We have 42% of our genome is retro elements. And this is how they arise. And these endogenous retroviruses move around as well. They duplicate and move around. And sometimes they cause disease because they integrate into a gene that's essential. And a number of human diseases have been linked to movement of these retro elements. All right, so here are the numbers and the different kinds of retro elements in the human genome. This is, in, this, to me, this is fascinating. So we have 42% of our genome retro elements. And again, a retro element is just a gene that can move around by re reverse transcription. 2.7 million <laughs> copies of various retro elements, 42% uh, of our genome. Uh, we, we divide them into non-LTR and LTR containing uh, retro elements. And the, these re the LTR containing ones include endogenous retroviruses, which got there by some kind of an infection, you know, about 8% of our genome. But then we have all these others were there before retroviruses ever existed. So we have some LTR containing retrotransposons that predate retroviruses. Then we have non-LTR uh, retro, retro elements as well. And of all these, less than 0.05% are active, meaning being transcribed. So most of them are just silent. So here are the different classes. Endogenous retrovirus, this is a consequence of a retroviral infection at some time in the past. And as I said, over time, these mutate and lose infectivity. Then we have retrotransposons. These are probably the precursors of retroviruses. These were here first, two LTRs, a gag, and a Paul gene, but no envelope. This is not a virus. There's no envelope. And what happened was... Somehow, an envelope gene was stolen from somewhere, 
and it made this into a retrovirus and it left the cell and that started the retroviruses. But retrotransposons were there first. Uh, okay, so those are the two kinds of LTR retro elements we have, the retroviruses and the retrotransposons, which is not a retrovirus, it's a precursor of them. Uh, then we have non-LTR retro elements, including lines. These are long interspersed nuclear elements. A lot of those in our genome, uh, they, they consist of, there's no LTR, but there's a duplicated host sequence at either end. And, and in fact, in m many of these, you can see all of them, they have the duplicated sequence, which is characteristic of integration, as I showed you. Um, so lines have a don't have LTRs, but they have open reading frames and they encode uh, reverse transcriptase, so they can move themselves around, uh, as can retrotransposons and endogenous retroviruses. But e even if you don't encode reverse transcriptase, which these last two categories do not, they can still move around because they can be copied by RT made by these other retro elements or by uh, RT that's floating around in, in the cell. So these are processed pseudogenes or signs, short interspersed nuclear elements. And these are just mRNAs that were copied by RT and they integrated somewhere else. So they have no introns. That's why we call them processed. And they move around. They mostly do nothing, but they can disrupt another gene. So the question here is, RT can bind DNA and excise it and move it? No, it's not. It's copying mRNA that's produced by transcription of a gene and making a DNA copy, which will then integrate somewhere else. Now, I want to give you a couple of examples of how uh, organisms have, have used genes provided by retroviruses. So one of the genes is the envelope gene in the retroviral genome. And the envelope, of course, is the spike, which allows the virus to bind to a cell receptor. It does then, it then allows fusion to occur between the virus and the cell membrane. So the spike is a fusogenic protein, right? If you produce just the spike on a cell and it, that cell interacts with another cell that has a receptor for the spike, these two cells will fuse. And it makes a syncytium, right? Remember, we talked about that a long time ago, cell-cell fusion. Well, it turns out that we and many other non-human primates have stolen the envelope gene to help make our placentas. So it's now called syncytion, syncytion one and two. And there, are, there appear to have been at least two distinct captures of this gene uh, many millions of years ago in these two lineages here. So here's humans and chimps and gorillas, orangutans, gibbons. We all share the syncytion one that probably uh, went into an ancestor or the retrovirus that carried it uh, went into an ancestor, you know, 30 million years ago. And we can still see the, the human endogenous retrovirus that donated it. But the gene has moved elsewhere in the genome and it serves to make a placenta and other monkeys have had a separate insertion. So basically, these uh, pre these ancestors were infected with a retrovirus, and then the envelope gene was taken, and the ancestors did not have a placenta. They either, they were probably marsupials, right? Or they laid eggs. <laughs> but capturing this allowed them to develop a placenta and have live birth. So here is the placenta. There's the fetal circulation. Uh, there's the the maternal down here, and this layer of cells, the syncytiotrophoblast, is all one fused cell layer, very important uh, in the structure of the placenta. And as the name indicates, it is produced by syncytia, syncytion fusing the individual cells. So our placentas wouldn't exist without a retrovirus infection many, many millions of years ago. We'd be laying eggs these days. We also think that other elements from retroviruses have been exapted. So exapted is the word we use when, when an organism takes a gene from a virus. Here's a, an endogenous retrovirus, HERV-K, that infected our ancestors 200,000 years ago, right? So here's human development, Homo sapiens and all our ancestors. 200,000 would be a right here. So somewhere 
in this branch here, uh, it, this virus infected us. So this is pretty modern, <laughs> right? Uh, but today we still have HERV-K. They don't make any virus in us. None, none of our HERVs make virus. HERV is human endogenous retrovirus. But actually, mRNAs from HERV-K are produced during embryogenesis. They're actually made from the eight cell stage. Uh, so here, here's your oocyte and then a zygote, two, four, and eight cell. So at eight cells, these mRNAs, these HERV-K mRNAs start to be made. They're, they're made into proteins and they last until the epiblast. And then they go away. But we, we think they induce an antiviral protein. And maybe that's they're protecting the early embryo from infection in some way. We actually don't know the function, but they're made. The mRNAs are made. We can see virus-like particles, actually. They're not infectious. So um, they may have some protective function. And there are many other examples. All, all kinds of promoters in our genome are actually taken from LTRs of uh, retroviruses. So we're using these things. And finally, you know, if you've ever seen a, bl a blue chicken egg, you can find these in various farms. I mean, the, the big producers, they don't sell them, but you get white or, or brown. But the reason they're blue is from a retrovirus that's infected the chicken. The retrovirus is integrated next to the gene for the blue pigment, and that's why they're blue. And when farmers breed chickens so that they lay blue eggs, what they're doing is breeding <laughs> the endogenous retrovirus that has inserted next to the chicken, uh, the, the dye gene, the blue dye. And so uh, people are asking, are they safe to eat? Yeah, they're safe. They're safe to eat. Uh, their, their virus will not infect you if there's any virus in the egg. The, no, there's not going to be any virus in the egg, most likely. So the, yeah, I get this question all the time. They're totally safe to eat. So I like to say, if, if not for retroviruses, we would lay eggs and they'd be white. Humans laying white eggs. Or I, I don't know if that's right, if our ancestors laid eggs or if they had plus, um, if they were marsupials, but it's it's kind of funny, right? Do they taste better in blue? <laughs> it's just the shell, but they're cute, right? They look great. Uh, our last question for today, which of the following statements about retro elements is not correct? There are many copies in the eukaryotic genome. They are currently in entering the koala germline. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They can be beneficial or none of the above. The wrong statement is those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They do not. So others of you said what's wrong is they are currently entering the koala germline. They are. And that's why it's cool because we can see them. They can be beneficial, right? We got syncytium from them, promoters. Okay, so that's the answer. So let's end up talking about the other uh, virus where reverse transcriptase is in the in the reproduction cycle. And this is interesting because it's a DNA virus, a patented virus or hepatitis B virus. These are enveloped virus where the we have an icosahedral nucleocapsid and the um, you know the envelope has spikes in it. Inside the nucleocapsid is this weird gapped, partially double-stranded DNA with a, with an enzyme, a protein attached to it and an RNA. And the protein is the you know, reverse transcriptase, as you will see here. And we'll, we'll explore what the RNA is in the moment. And this uh, double-stranded DNA, when it's repaired, it gives rise to a whole num bunch of transcripts which overlap to make all the proteins you need. So how does this work? The virus binds, <clears throat> excuse me, to the plasma membrane. Uh, it fuses at the plasma membrane. The nucleocapsid comes in the cytosol, it docks on the nuclear pore, and the DNA goes in the nucleus. It's immediately chromatinized. It's repaired by the host cell. The host cell enzymes take off the protein. They take off the RNA. They repair the single strand. Now we have closed circular uh, DNA, and it's uh, chromatinized. It can now be transcribed to make mRNAs which go out in the cytosol. And those uh, mRNAs go on to build a capsid. And um, the mRNAs go inside the capsid. And also in the capsid is reverse transcriptase. So the RNA uh, is converted to DNA. And so here, this is weird. 
because the art reverse transcription actually happens in the cytoplasm before the virus is released from the cell. Remember, the retroviruses have RNA genomes, and their reverse transcription happens when they infect cells. These, these particles can't wait. They start to reverse transcribe um, before they even leave the cell. And eventually, they're brought uh, released from cells in, in vesicles like this one, and they acquire their spikes by budding into the ER, as you can see here. Then they move away from the ER in vesicles to be released. And by the time they get out, they have that gapped DNA in, in them with only a small piece of RNA left. So reverse transcription all happens in, uh, during the assembly of these viruses. And there's no genome integration, right? The transcription occurs by transcription of that closed circular DNA in the nucleus that comes in. Uh, and, um, excuse me, it does not integrate. And... That genome, that DNA makes the mRNAs that gives rise to proteins as well as new genomes uh, in the new particles. So let's take a look at this reverse transcription. RT is viral. Or I don't know. The question is, where does the RT come from? Are you talking about hep B? It's viral. Or the, the signs. For the signs, it's from a retro element. So here's the viral RNA on the top left. In the part, uh, in this, um, <clears throat> in the particle that's being assembled, right in a newly infected cell, so it's RNA. Right, so we'll go back here. This first particle that's assembled, it's got the genomic uh, RNA in it. So that's that. <clears throat> this RNA is capped. It's polydentylated. It has repeat structures and stem loops that are going to be important. It has a molecule of reverse transcriptase attached to it. And in the particle, as that particle is assembling, right there at step 10, 10 to uh, step 11, the reverse transcriptase, TP, starts to make a DNA copy on this little stem loop to which it's attached. All right, the, the reverse transcriptase is attached to this stem loop. And again, you can see it's, at the, it's near the five prime end of the RNA, kind of like the retroviruses. It makes this uh, short DNA, but it doesn't go very far. It doesn't go to the end of the RNA because this piece of DNA flips to the other strand. There's a strand exchange, first template exchange right there. So now you see that little piece of DNA that was made is now hybridizing to really the three prime end of the viral RNA. And then the RT continues the RNA template is removed by the RNA SH activity of RT, right? And here now we have our first strand. Uh, there is the, the very five prime end of the RNA is not degraded. DR1, it contains DR1, as you can see here. There's the cap, and that serves as the primer for the second strand. So now we're, we're going up here. That primer, though... <laughs> doesn't continue around uh, this strand. It does a second template exchange. It's going to jump up here to DR2. It's going to go from DR1 to DR2, and that's shown here. So now we have the RNA primer. It's left the three prime end. It's starting to copy uh, towards the five prime end of this, uh, of this DNA. So then, then we have it here, right? We got to the end there, and now uh, it it starts to go to the other strand again. So this 3 prime R, you can see now it's hybridizing with the newly synthesized second strand. And the second strand is made, but it never finishes. And you end up with this. And why doesn't it finish? Because this is inside the capsid. And it runs out of triphosphates. The capsid is closed, and when it closes, it grabs a bunch of triphosphates from the pool in the cell, and when RT commences, it can only go so far. So you make a partially double-stranded molecule. You can see there are parts of it that are double-stranded here. A lot of it is single-stranded because the RT stops. That's all that single strand. You have a piece of RNA left. The primer for the second strand is left. That's what the RNA is from. It still has a cap on it <laughs> left over from the RNA. Uh, 
And then the protein is stuck on the end. That's the reverse transcription. It's transcriptase, excuse me. Does that mean that the gap size would vary? Yeah, depending on how many triphosphates were captured, right. So that's why we have that weird structure because the reverse transcription happens inside the capsid as it's assembled in the cell and it runs out of triphosphates. So now you know the answer to that. Weirdness, isn't it? It's just weird. So here's what we've talked about today. We've talked about retroviruses which package RNA. So in this picture, what is yellow is in the virus particle. So for retroviruses, the RNA is packaged. And when the virus infects a new cell, it's converted to DNA, which are then, of course, integrates into the genome. And the hepatoviruses, on the other hand, package DNA. They actually package RNA in the beginning, right, in the host cell. But it starts to reverse transcribe before that virus leaves the cell. So the virus particles made and released from the cell end up having DNA in them. Yes, it's, you could consider it just short of finishing the job. Absolutely. Leave it up to the next cell. And this, of course, gets repaired in the next cell that's infected. But there are other uh, retroviruses, uh, not, not retroviruses, I would say retroid. They have reverse transcriptase in their reproduction cycle. So hepatinoviruses are not retroviruses, but they have reverse transcriptase. Um, and these others have reverse transcriptase. So foamy retroviruses, these are actually retroviruses related to other retroviruses, uh, but they package DNA. Uh, I mean, maybe 5 to 20% of virus particles have DNA, probably for the same reason uh, as uh, hep hepatitis B viruses package DNA. They first put in RNA, like other retroviruses, then begins reverse transcriptase um, before it leaves the cell. And then we have these plant uh, retroid viruses, Kelly Fowler mosaic virus, uh, which package DNA for the same reason as hepatitis B virus. They actually initially package RNA in the cell as they're assembling and it becomes reverse transcribed uh, before uh, it leaves the cell. So there's not just one way to do this, obviously. You can do reverse transcription in the way in or on the way out. Mm -hmm. All right, so next time we're going to talk about assembly of virus particles. We're going to talk about how you put together the different kinds, icosahedral, nucleocapsids, uh, and so forth.